Right, we're just getting this set up. Okay, good. So, um, welcome everyone to the Irish American Heritage Museum. And I'm absolutely thrilled to have, uh, really, I suppose, Irish America's preeminent scholar, uh, Dr. Kevin Kenny, who's Glucksman Professor of History at NYU and the director down there of Glucksman Ireland House. Dr. Kenny, of course, has written uh, several, you know, amazing books. His dissertation, um, which he completed in Columbia University, won the Bancroft Award. He taught at the University of Texas and then at Boston College before joining um, NYU. His first book, which we'll be talking about tonight, which is reissued a 25th anniversary edition, uh, was Making Sense of the Molly Maguires. And it examined how traditions of Irish rural protest were transplanted into industrial America and the response that they got here and what that says about labor and immigrants uh, in America. He has also written The American Irish A History, Peaceable Kingdom Lost, which looked at William Penn's utopian vision of harmonious coexistence between Native Americans and European co um, colonists, and Diaspora, a very short introduction, which is obviously a massive subject to take on. His latest book is The Problem of Immigration in a Slaveholding Republic, Policing Mobility in the 19th Century United States. And so that looks again at how immigration policy uh, moved from local to national level, uh, right the way from the American Revolution all the way up through the end of Reconstruction. So welcome, Dr. Kenny. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll be filtering people in. Those of you who are online with us can uh, write questions in the Q&A feature down here. I you know, will disappear off the screen. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kenny. And then at the end, we'll take questions. Um, you know, I can filter those through for you. So welcome, everyone. And uh, thank you very much. I'm going to share the screen now. And I'll get out of it. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Elizabeth, and thank you for the the invitation to um, give this presentation this evening. I'll probably talk for thirty five to forty minutes, and then I'd love to take um, questions from the um, the audience as as the evening develops. So. Um, my subject is uh, the Molly Maguires and how to make sense of them. Uh, 20 Irish men were hanged in the anthracite region of Northeast Pennsylvania in the 1870s, convicted of a series of 16 killings stretching back to the Civil War. And the convicted men were said to be members of a secret society imported from Ireland called the Molly Maguires. Hostile contemporaries described the Molly Maguires as inherently savage Irish immigrants who had imported a violent uh, conspiracy that had no place in industrial America. Challenges to this nativist myth in the first half of the 20th century um, really flipped the myth on its head and put together a counter myth that transposed the category of evil from the immigrants to their exploiters casting the Irish as entirely innocent victims of economic, religious, or ethnic oppression. And neither interpretation makes sense uh, to me as a historian. The Molly Maguires were not depraved killers, uh, but neither were they figments of the nativist or the anti-labor imagination. They never existed as the conspiracy imagined by their enemies, but they did use violence to combat their exploitation. 20 Irish men died on the scaffold, uh, but 16 other men were killed as well. And their killers, whatever they may have called themselves, became known to history as the Molly Maguires. So in writing their history uh, 25 years ago and celebrating the publication of that book uh, in its 25th anniversary edition this month, um, I set out to determine who were the Molly Maguires uh, what did they do and why did they do it? So I'll lay that out for you this evening and then reflect a little bit on some of the more recent interpretations that have um, come up since I published the book. There were two uh, waves of uh, Molly Maguire violence uh, in, the, in the Anthracite region. The first was during the Civil War and directly afterwards, it, it featured a, some sort of rudimentary labor organization a shadowy group known variously in the sources as the committee, the Buckshots or the Molly Maguires. Nobody was convicted of any of those six killings at the time. It's significantly they were traced retroactively to the Molly Maguires. 
only after a second wave of violence occurred, uh, peaking in the mid-1870s, uh, up to 15 years later. And this second wave of violence consisted of three overlapping forms. There was ethnic gang warfare between the Irish and the Welsh, attacks on public officials, including magistrates and policemen, and attacks on superintendents and uh, foremen. So, Elizabeth, if you could put up the second slide, thank you. Um, this is a slide of James McParlin, uh, the villain in the piece. Um, the Molly Maguires were convicted and hanged mainly on the evidence of James McParlin, an undercover Pinkerton detective who entered the Pennsylvania anthracite region in the 1870s, uh, infiltrated the organization, and by informing against his countrymen, violated one of the cardinal norms of Irish culture. Few figures are more hated in Irish history than the informant. In his reports uh, back to Philadelphia from the mining region, McParlin linked the Molly Maguires to a fraternal ethnic organization called the Ancient Order of Hibernians. Most of the convicted Molly Maguires were members of the AOH, and it's clear from the evidence, even allowing for McParlin's distortions, that some of them used local lodges for violent as well as fraternal purposes. Establishing this connection between a loosely organized pattern of violence on the one hand and an ethnic institution with a national and even international network of lodges had devastating consequences for the Molly Maguires. It equipped them with an institutional structure way out of proportion to their numbers. And this was grist for the mill of conspiracy theorists then and ever since, because it allowed them to magnify the threat posed by a small, desperate, and often misguided group of immigrant workers. Contemporaries portrayed the Molly Maguires as a vast, well-organized movement directly imported from Ireland, hell-bent on subverting American liberty and democracy. The prosecution offered no plausible explanation of motive at the trials, and nor, it seems, was any explanation accepted. The explanation for Irish depra depravity was that the Irish were depraved by nature. They killed people because that was the type of people they were. Now, this argument, while perfectly circular, was surprisingly powerful in mid-19th century America. Contemporaries denounced Irish-American violence from the labor upheavals and urban rioting of the antebellum era to the draft riots of the Civil War and the orange and green riots of 1870 and 1871. They saw this as the logical transatlantic outgrowth of allowing an alien immigrant culture to take root in the in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have Alan Pinkerton, the founder of the famous detective agency, who sent James McParlin into the mining country as an undercover agent. And uh, Pinkerton himself published the first history of the Molly Maguires in 1877, even as the trials and exec executions were still underway. This um, ghost-written book, The Molly Maguires and the Detectives, laid down the foundational myth inherently depraved Irish immigrants brought to justice by an intrepid detective that endured for several generations thereafter. Uh, next slide, please. The myth of the Molly Maguires resurfaced, for example, in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's novel, The Valley of Fear, in 1904. Uh, this is one of four uh, Sherlock Holmes stories that are set as novels. The rest are short stories. And uh, Conan Doyle actually met Alan Pinkerton's son on a transatlantic crossing, learned about the Molly Maguires, and borrowed their story for the plot of his novel. Uh, the second part of the novel takes the form of an extended flashback to the exploits of a group called the Scourers, the murderous inner circle of the ancient order of freemen. The story is set in the Vermissa Valley, quote, a gloomy land of black crag and tangled forest, surrounded by dark and often impenetrable woods, end quote, uh, known to its, it, its inhabitants as the Valley of Fear. Next slide, please. Presiding over the Scourers is Black Jack McGinty, a figure based on the real-life uh, Black Jack John Kehoe, 
the alleged ringleader of the Molly Maguires. The case is cracked by an undercover detective named John McMurdo, who infiltrates the organization, ingratiates himself with its members, and brings the criminals to justice. Uh, next slide, please. In the 1930s, a period of renewed labor activism in the United States, um, the tide of interpretation began to turn. Anthony Bimba was the first historian to offer a major revision. His book, The Molly Maguires, published in 1932, restored the Mollies to the only context in which they make sense, the concerted struggle between labor and capital in America's violent Gilded Age. But Bimba was so concerned to uh, overturn the prevailing interpretation that he really just proposed a counter myth of his own. He turned the original myth on its head, retaining its elements of circularity consp and conspiracy, and transferring the burden of evil from Irish workers to their employers. Uh, this approach, however, left open the question of who killed the Molly Maguire's victims. What, uh, J. Walter Coleman, also in the 1930s, produced a better book, The Molly Maguire Riots, Industrial Conflict in Pennsylvania, uh, better for two reasons. One is he connected the violence to a tradition of protest in the Irish countryside that I'm going to talk a lot about this evening. And the other is that he pointed out um, the fundamental thing about James McParlin, uh, whose reports provide the basis of the whole Molly Maguire narrative, is that McParlin was a liar by profession. That was his job. He was an undercover uh, detective. Um, it's hard to imagine how we would take his narrative at uh, face value. The next book published on the Molly Maguires, uh, briefly, I just need to go through these to set up my own argument, was Wayne Broll's book in uh, 1963, which was the standard uh, work when I set out to write my own. Um, Broll uh, offered important insights on the corporate strategy of Franklin Benjamin Gowan. Uh, next slide, please. The um, One of the minor robber barons of the uh, Gilded Age era, the president of the uh, Philadelphia Reading Railroad, who hired the Pinkertons to infiltrate the labor movement as part of his campaign to control the production and transportation uh, of coal. Uh, in other ways, I think his work was a step backward compared to Coleman's. Coleman certainly was much better on the uh, Irish background. But of course, I was predisposed to be critical of Wayne Broll as a PhD student writing a dissertation that I hoped would supplant his interpretation. A generation later, uh, with more gray hair and with my doctoral megalomania long behind me, uh, I'm inclined to see uh, rather more merit in his work. Uh, next slide, please, Elizabeth. In 1970, at the height of another radical period in American history, Detective James McParlin uh, finally emerged as the villain uh, rather than the hero of the piece. Uh, the film version of the Molly Maguires starred Sean Connery as the alleged ringleader John Kehoe, Richard Harris as the turncoat detective James McParlin. In the climactic scene, McParlin goes to visit John Kehoe in his death cell. You came for absolution. Kehoe informs the detective, punishment, that's what you want. You think punishment's all that can set you free. Kehoe pounces on McParlin and thrashes him until he is hauled off by the guards. Are you free now, Kehoe demands. You'll never be free. There's no punishment this side of hell can set you free from what you did. So there's the uh, old myth uh, turned um, upside down once again. There's an interesting footnote to American cultural history here because the film's director, Martin Ritt, and producer Walter Bernstein had both been blacklisted uh, during the McCarthy era. And they saw their film in part as a response to the director, Elia Kazan, who cooperated with the HUAC investigations in the 1950s and whose hero in On the Waterfront, played by Marlon Brando, famously informs against corrupt union bosses. Uh, the movie, uh, however, did not have the uh, commercial impact uh, they had uh, hoped for. But still, along with Coleman's book, A Generation Earlier, it cleared a path for the new history that I eventually wrote. 
uh, when I did the research uh, in the late 80s and early 1990s. Now, my interest in the Molly Maguires had modest beginnings. I was assigned to write some encyclopedia entries for Eric Foner's and Jack Garrity's The Reader's Companion to American History, the kind of task that graduate students eagerly take on to earn some money and to get their first publications. I found it easy to complete all of the entries except one, the one on the Molly Maguires. I went to the secondary sources. There was no consensus on who the Mollies were, why they behaved the way they did, or indeed whether they even existed uh, institutionally. Um, I knew something about the Molly Maguires in Ireland, both as a group of rural agitators um, during the famine and as a generic term for popular protest. Uh, but the American episode remained baffling. I cobbled together a tentative entry for the encyclopedia and then devoted most of the remainder of my doctoral career to the subject. Now, the intellectual origins of the project were obviously deeper than that. Uh, as an undergraduate at the University of Edinburgh, I had read E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class, and I belong to the tail end of the generation of historians shaped by that book. As a graduate student at Columbia, I came to realize that American immigration and labor history were inseparable. And in my own work, um, I really um, approached um, the Molly Maguires as a form of what we call uh, history from below, uh, the history of ordinary migrant uh, workers as they uh, struggled you know, to reproduce their lives and struggled against the exploitation that they faced in the mining region. The issue here was that the Molly Maguires themselves being so socially marginalized and being largely uh, illiterate or preliterate, they, they, many of them spoke Irish, um, they left us virtually no evidence, indeed just two letters uh, in which they speak in their own voice. In other words, they represent an extreme case of uh, history from below. And yet in writing their story, uh, I wanted to know more than just why critics of immigration and organized labor disliked the Irish and disliked the Molly Maguires. I wanted to know who they were, what they did, and why they did it. Uh, and I needed an explanation that broke free of the two existing poles of interpretation, the Molly Maguires as depraved killers on the one hand, and the Molly Maguires as innocent victims of oppression, whether economic, religious, or ethnic on the other. So the starting place for any interpretation of the Molly Maguires is the country where they originated. When I first encountered the story, I immediately noticed something strangely familiar. As someone trained in both Irish and American history, I could see that the violence in Pennsylvania conformed to a pattern uh, in the history of the Irish countryside. The first reports of the Molly Maguires in Ireland date back to the 1840s and 1850s. They were the last in a long line of secret societies and protest groups that included the White Boys, the Oak Boys, the Ribbon Men, and the Lady Clares. Uh, the next slide, please, uh, Elizabeth. The men who joined these organizations wore uh, female clothing both as a form of disguise and to signify their allegiance to a mythical woman who symbolized their struggle. You see this uh, quote here from a well-known uh, land agent, William Stewart Trench, referring to the women's clothes, the blackened faces, the disguise. Uh, they smeared themselves in the most fantastic manner with burned cork about their eyes, mouths, and cheeks. A group called the Molly Maguires first emerged in rural Ireland towards the end of the Great Famine. According to one story, a woman named Molly Maguire was to be evicted from her cottage. She refused to leave and the bailiffs leveled the building on top of her. The Molly Maguires banded together to avenge her memory. According to another story, Molly Maguire was herself a young woman, a pistol strapped to each thigh, who led her followers through the countryside seeking justice and vengeance. And these are good stories, 
but they can be found in too many parts of Ireland to be taken literally. Among other things, Molly Maguire would have had needed to be in several places at once. The stories do, however, make sense in the context of rural popular culture. We know from the sources that the Molly Maguires in Ireland were men, not women, and that they were so named because they disguised themselves in women's clothing, used powder or burned cork on their faces, and pledged their allegiance to Mistress Molly Maguire. The clothing and makeup served as a disguise, allowing violence to go undetected. But at a deeper level, um, the disguise also invested the individual Molly Maguire with the authority of the symbolic figure on whose behalf he was fighting. And indeed, this kind of popular violence was once widespread in early modern Europe. It survived longer in rural Ireland than anywhere else because um, that part of Ireland was so uh, isolated. You do find similar groups uh, such as the Rebecca's in Wales at that time or the Demoiselle d'Ariège in the Pyrenees. But Ireland had perhaps the most widespread and concerted pattern of this kind of violence in early and mid uh, 19th century uh, Europe. The white from the white boys of the 1760s through the ribbon men to the Molly Maguires, these societies sought to enforce their own moral code in response to violations of customary practices of land usage by landlords, agents, and tenants. They took vengeance on those who enclosed common land with fences, replaced tenants with animals, or converted tillage land to grazing. Sometimes they maimed or killed animals as symbols of commercial farming. The insurgents often acted under cover of darkness. Officials in Dublin and London referred to them as midnight legislators, one of my favorite uh, phrases from the sources. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So Irish immigrants carried elements of this distinctive tradition with them across the Atlantic to North America to a limited but significant extent. On the canals, public works and railroads, and later in the coal mines, the Irish fought back against their exploitation with violence. Sometimes immigrants from one part of Ireland did battle with those from another in factions, but they were fighting not for the sake of fighting, but for access to employment, with each side attempting to drive the other off the works. They also retaliated against bosses who were late in paying them by destroying the work they had done, in much the same way as secret societies in Ireland destroyed fences and dug up pasture land to render it fit for potato cultivation by the poor. I've not encountered evidence of disguise in women's clothing on this side of the Atlantic, but organizations of the white boy and ribbon men type with hand grips, passwords, recognition signs, oaths of secrecy and threatening notices were reported among Irish canal workers in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic Mid states. The American Molly Maguires were evidently a transatlantic outgrowth of this distinctively Irish pattern of um, rural protest. Yet, contrary to the conspiracy theorists, there does not appear to have been any direct organizational continuity between the Irish and American versions. There's no evidence at all that a secret society was imported into America by Irish immigrants. The nucleus of the Molly Maguires in Pennsylvania came from the remote northwestern county of Donegal. Many of them were Irish speakers. None of them had criminal backgrounds in Ireland. They did arrive in Pennsylvania, however, with a cultural memory and with established social traditions. Next slide, please. Faced with appalling conditions in the mines of Pennsylvania, where fatality rates were three times higher than in Europe, these immigrant workers responded by deploying a specifically Irish form of collective violence against their enemies. And they did so, as I explained at the outset, under the umbrella of the ancient order of uh, Hibernians. So the Molly Maguires, in other words, were not a figment of the conspiratorial imagination. Indeed, the conspiracy theories about them could have achieved little credibility if Irish workers had not been engaged in collective violence of some sort. The point is that they never engaged in violence on the scale they were accused of doing. The Molly Maguires 
embodied an archaic form of labor protest with its roots in the Irish countryside that was poorly suited to conditions in industrializing America. The classic form of labor organizing in an industrial economy, after all, is not the secret society, it is the trade union. And as early as the 1840s, uh, Irish canal workers and Irish laborers were gravitating away from the um, rural tradition of violence and towards uh, um, um, involvement and indeed leadership of um, the American labor movement in the form of trade unionism. Next uh, slide, please. This is John Siney the Irish-born uh, miner who was the founder and first leader of the largest union in the United States in the 1860s and 1870s, the Working Men's Benevolent Association, founded in Schuylkill County, County, Pennsylvania, in the heart of the Lower Anthracite region in 1868. The WBA, the Working Men's Benevolent Association, mobilized 35,000 uh, mine workers across the anthracite region, first under Siney's leadership, and then under another Irish-born miner, John Welsh. The union attempted with considerable success to unite all anthracite workers, regardless of their national origin, religion, or skill level. So by the late 1860s and in the early 1870s, the labor movement in the anthracite region took uh, two distinct, if overlapping, forms. You had the big, powerful, and inclusive union, which opened its doors to all mine workers who wished to join. Alongside uh, the union, to some extent overlapping with it, lurking within the shadows of the ancient order of Hibernians, there was a much smaller and exclusively Irish group of mine laborers, led as in Ireland by tavern keepers who favored direct violent action and became known as the Molly Maguires. Uh, both groups wanted, at a fundamental level, the same thing. Uh, a letter from an anonymous Molly Maguire in 1875, one of the two surviving letters I mentioned at the outset, put it this way, quote, I have told ye the mind of the children of Mistress Molly Maguire. All we want is a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. And that's what we can't get now by a long shot. But the two groups went about the task of redressing their grievances in different ways. The union men sat down at the table as representatives of the working class with representatives of the employer capitalist class and tried to hammer out an agreement on wages and working conditions. If negotiations failed, they had a very powerful weapon at their disposal. They could go on strike and cripple production. The Molly Maguires, and if I could have the next slide, please, took a more local and individual perspective. If a mine operator was treating Irishmen unfairly, unfairly by reserving the best jobs for Welshmen or by paying the Welsh more than the Irish for the same work, they dealt with him directly rather than through mediation or collect, collective bargaining. First, they delivered a verbal warning telling him to cut it out. If he did not listen, they nailed a sheet of paper to his door with a coffin sketched on it, accompanied by the words, this will be yours. The coffin notice could be followed by a beating. The ultimate sanction was assassination. The violent underground tradition to which the Molly Maguires belonged was born of desperation and was sporadically organized at best. The union model, by contrast, was based on strength in numbers favored collective bargaining, and the leaders of the union condemned violence as morally wrong and tactically counterproductive. The actions of a militant few, they warned, might destroy the labor movement as a whole. So if I could have the next slide, please. So here you see a map of Pennsylvania with the anthracite region shaded, and then a detailed map of the anthracite region itself which is split into a northern field and then a southern field and two middle fields. Molly Maguire's were active uh, down south. You see Schuylkill, uh, uh, Pottsville, Ashland, Tamakoa, Shenandoah, Hazelton. These were the Molly Maguire strongholds. In the north, in Wilkesbury and Scranton, anthracite mining was controlled from the beginning uh, by a, pu a few powerful 
corporations they had a monopoly uh, over the production of coal as well as its distribution. They shipped their coal down to New York. In the south, in the southern region, the middle and, and southern regions, uh, partly for geological reasons, the way that the coal seams had formed, um, it was both easier and much more difficult to get coal out of the ground. And what I mean by that is you could you could almost scrape it from the surface um, if you were a small independent businessman, but to really get at the richest coal seams, you needed deep shaft mining. You needed to, to um, penetrate hundreds of feet below the ground. And that did not happen until the um, late 19th century and indeed uh, in the 20th century through uh, strip mining. So in the southern region, Franklin Benjamin Gowan, the man who uh, hired the Pinkertons and hired James McParland to go in undercover, wanted to reproduce the same um, conditions of monopoly control that pertained in the North. In other words, he wanted to uh, establish a monopoly through his uh, railroad, the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, over the mining of coal and the transportation of coal. And there were a number of obstacles standing in his in his way. Uh, the first uh, and least of the obstacles was that his corporate charter uh, forbid the railroad from owning coal mines. It just wasn't allowed to do that. That was an easy problem to solve through bribery uh, in the Gilded Age. Um, Gowan pay, paid the necessary people in the legislature and had the um, corporate charter changed Two other obstacles were more formidable. One is uh, because of the structure of the economy, there were about 160 small uh, coal operators uh, standing in the way of monopoly control. One of my main sources for this book is a newspaper called The Miner's Journal, but that was the journal of the um, small independent mine operators, not of the mine workers. Gowan eliminated the small operators. He bought them out. Second uh, major obstacle, the labor movement. Very, very powerful trade union movement. Well, Franklin Gowan's uh, strategy there was to argue consistently and effectively that the Molly Maguires were simply the terrorist arm of the trade union movement. He collapsed them into the same category. The union leaders never wavered from their condemnation of violence, uh, as I said, they saw it as morally wrong, but also as tactically disastrous because they were afraid that they would be equated with the Molly Maguires. Well, they were indeed. And Elizabeth, if you bring up the next uh, um, um, slide, here we see um, an image of the long strike of 1875 when the union went down finally to a crushing defeat against Gowan and his railroad after six months of a labor uh, stoppage culminating in scenes of near starvation at the height of a, na a national economic depression. Now, it's very significant that the second wave of Molly Maguire violence took place directly then in the mid-1870s, in 1875. The Molly Maguire stepped into the vacuum left by the destruction of the uh, labor movement. The union at its height between 1868 and 1875, by accepting all workers, regardless of background, skill level or condition, actually um, provides the period of stability and tranquility between the two waves of Molly Maguire violence. The arrests began in uh, 1876. The defendants were arrested um, by the coal and iron police, a private police force run by the railroad. Uh, assisted by Pinkerton detectives. About 50 Molly Maguires went on trial between 1875 and 1878. The defense attorneys went through the motions at best. No Catholics uh, served on the juries. The defendants were tried in groups. They did not testify on their own behalf. In effect, the AOH was put on trial. Mere membership of that organization was presented as de facto membership of the Molly Maguires. Most of the prosecuting attorneys were um, were uh, railroad lawyers. And indeed, the star prosecuting attorney at uh, several of the trials was none other than Franklin Benjamin Gowan, uh, 
who came up to the mining region, um, led the prosecution and published his speeches as best-selling uh, pamphlets. Uh, next slide, uh, please. The executions of the Molly Maguires were carefully choreographed so that the offended majesty of the law could instill terror into the inhabitants of the mining region. Ten of the men were hanged on a single day, June 21st, 1877. Uh, four of them in the town of Mauch Chunk, uh, known uh, subsequently as Jim Thorpe in um, Carbon County, the other six in uh, uh, Pottsville. And uh, next slide, uh, please. As I will draw this now to a uh, conclusion and uh, hope to bring in um, uh, some uh, degree of conversation uh, from the audience. So a century after these tragic events, descendants of the Molly Maguires in Schuylkill County organized a campaign to obtain a posthumous pardon for John Kehoe, the alleged ringleader of the Molly Maguires, who was convicted in 1877 of the very first killing attributed to the group, uh, that of the mine superintendent Frank Langdon, way back during the labor disputes during the Civil War uh, 15 years previously. In the second letter that survives from uh, Molly Maguire, written from Pottsville Prison before his execution in 1878, Kehoe noted that by bribery, perjury, and prejudice, I am under the sentence of death for a crime I never committed. Among those agitating on Keogh's behalf were his granddaughter, Alice Wayne, and his great-grandson, Joseph Wayne, the proprietor of the Wayne Hotel in Gerardville, where John Kehoe's tavern, the Hibernia House, had been located. And they were joined by members of the Pennsylvania Labor History Society. On September 6, 1978, Pennsylvania Governor Milton Schapp issued a statement paying tribute to the Molly Maguires. Schapp bluntly stated uh, that Gowan's, quote, fervent desire to wipe out any signs of resistance in the coal fields, end quote, sent 20 men to the gallows. The whole affair, he concluded, had been a dreadful miscarriage of justice. Quote, but we can be proud of the men known as the Molly Maguires because they defiantly faced allegations which attempted to make trade unionism a criminal conspiracy. End quote. All Pennsylvanians, uh, Schapp wrote, uh, join with the members of the Pennsylvania Labor History Society in paying tribute to these martyred men of labor. January 12th, 1979, the Pennsylvania Board of Pardons recommended a posthumous pardon for John Kehoe. Governor Schapp signed that pardon the following day. The Molly Maguires were indeed martyred men of labor. Some of them may have been innocent. Others may have been guilty as charged, while still more may have been convicted of the wrong crime. We can never know for certain. For a short period in the 1860s and 1870s, a few local lodges of the ancient order of Hibernians provided the institutional shell in which the Molly Maguires operated. Some Irishmen used these lodges for violent purposes, adapting to local conditions, a strategy of protest, that had its origins in the Irish countryside. To this extent, uh, the Molly Maguires did in, indeed exist, even if they never existed as the vast organized conspiracy imagined by their enemies. So in closing, I want to offer just a few reflections on recent interpretations of the subject. Given that each generation since the 1870s has produced a new history of the Molly Maguires, it's high time that somebody challenged and debunked my interpretation. But since I published uh, my book in 1998, uh, only two other authors uh, have written on the subject. And so far, my interpretation remains intact. Next slide, please. Uh, we could put up the next slide of recent interpretations. Thank you. Uh, so published in 2014, Mark Bulick's uh, The Sons of Molly Maguire presented important new information on labor activism and popular protest in the early phase of the conflict during and after the Civil War. And Bulick also connected Molly Maguireism to the tradition of mummery in rural Ireland. 
The second book you see there, Brandon McSivna's The End of Outrage, uh, published in 2017, revealed a deeper and broader tradition of Molly Maguire activity in Donegal than I had realized and uncovered a significant degree of reverse migration and cultural influence from Pennsylvania back to Ireland. McSivna's title, The End of Outrage, contains a triple pun. It refers to the goal of Irish agrarian protest. It refers to the termination of that tradition by the famine. And it refers to the failure of subsequent generations to acknowledge what had happened. If I were rewriting the book today, uh, I might use some literary techniques I've learned since starting out. Uh, rather than cramming everything one needs to know about Ireland into chapter one, I might cut back and forth across the Atlantic throughout the book. It's not clear, however, that the book would be better uh, for these uh, conceits. Other than a new preface to the 25th anniversary edition, um, the book presents the original text, warts and all. But it does at least contain all the intellectual passion of a raw youth. The book deals with gender adequately um, in addressing the image of Mistress Molly Maguire, and it deals with the rough culture of masculine labor. Uh, the next historian could perhaps deal much more with the lives of women. Uh, next slide. Uh, thank you. Back to the marked man. Um, I was able to infer the structure of class and ethnicity uh, from using census records. Uh, the book as it stands contains fleeting glimpses that could illuminate more. For example, a young Donegal woman killed in a Pinkerton vigilante attack on a Molly Maguire home. Or another that sticks in my mind, a 68-year-old Donegal woman asking for an interpreter in the courtroom because she was a monolingual, a monolingual Irish speaker. Making sense of the Molly Maguires was resolutely skeptical in its approach to historical evidence. 25 years later, I retained this skepticism about what the sources can tell us about the Molly Maguires while I think confronting more directly the fact that they killed people. Next slide, please. I've given many public lectures on the Molly Maguires over the years, including one inside the old jail museum in Jim Thorpe, next to the cells where four condemned Mollies were held on the eve of their execution on Black Thursday. My message that the Molly Maguires were real is not always the one that my audiences expect or want to hear. Yet, while we will never know if every man convicted was guilty as charged, the Molly Maguires did clearly act as a group to avenge themselves against their enemies in ways that made sense to them. Historical inquiry requires empathy, an attempt to understand what made sense to others. Most of the empathy in making sense of the Molly Maguires is for the downtrodden Irish, the insulted and the injured of the American Industrial Revolution. Empathy, though, is not the same as sympathy. To explain a historical phenomenon is not to justify it. Historians do not sit as judge and jury on the past. They try as far as possible to make sense of the past on its own terms. In the case of the Molly Maguires, this involves an effort to understand the violence, not to condone or condemn it. In making sense of the Molly Maguires, I was not asking whether people's actions were right or wrong, I was trying to determine what they did and why. In teaching the book over the last quarter century, the this line between explanation and justification sometimes grows uh, uncomfortably narrow. For example, in the aftermath of September 11, 2001, I sometimes had to explain that I was seeking to understand the Molly Maguires, not to defend their actions. It was challenging at that time to teach uh, other similar topics including the Haymarket Affair of 1877, or the Sacco and Vanzetti case of the 1920s. And the final slide, please. Since the book's uh, publication, industrial labor has become less prominent in American historical writing, and the field of immigration history has moved in new directions. When I applied for my first academic job at the University of Texas in 1994, it was in a position explicitly advertised as U.S. immigration and labor history. But one sees that word labor only very rarely in job ads in history today. 
Nonetheless, labor history in some form will remain important as long as we remember that people worked in the past. And the main themes of the book, class, labor organizing, nativism, cultural adaptation, and history from below, remain central to immigration history today. As the Columbia historian Henry Steele Commager put it in the opening line of his New York Times review of Coleman's book on the Molly Maguires in 1936, few things furnish a more illuminating indication of the changing temper of our time than the reinterpretation of the American labor struggle. Making sense of the Molly Maguires had an impact in its scholarly fields, but one of the most gratifying things about the book for me is the correspondence I received from readers beyond the university. Some of these readers are descendants of the Molly Maguires or their victims. Others worked in the coal mines or belonged to families who did. All of them, like me, are engrossed by this tragic episode in American history and how to make sense of why it happened. Thank you. Thank you. That was fabulous. Um, so we have a few people online on, on both screens. I'll toggle back and forth between uh, the two of them <laughs> so I can keep an eye on the questions. Yes. Um, I suppose, you know, I'll just kick it off. How, I mean, obviously you've laid it out there first, but I'm wondering, um, Dr. Kenny, are you convinced that they were as organized as, you know, Gowan and McPartlin and all that led them to believe? Or was it, I mean, clearly the AOH aren't behind it, you know. Yeah, maybe yeah. They, they have membership in both. But, you know, did men sit around and plot to kill a mine boss or was it kind of a crime of opportunity? And I think your book too mentions a little bit of, you know, there was Welsh workers and everybody wasn't Irish. And so there's a little bit yeah, of yeah. conflict in the mines themselves too. Which may yes, have uh, definitely. Uh, so they were nowhere near being a, a well-organized uh, conspiracy of the kind they were accused of being um, right. by the enemies of the Irish, the enemies of organized labor, or the prosecuting attorneys at the trial. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, there was uh, a pattern of violence, and there were 16 men killed uh, uh, as well as the 20 men hanged. So that's kind of the the, the puzzle I'm trying to figure out. Um, the first thing I would say is that um, the Molly Maguires did not have a monopoly on violence in, in the anthracite region. It was an, uh, Gilded Age America was extraordinarily violent in its class conflict. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this story, you will find that only two institutions steadfastly and unequivocally denounced violence. They were the trade union movement, mm. the Working Men's Benevolent Association, firstly, and secondly, the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Catholic Church, in effect, excommunicated. Uh, the Archbishop in Philadelphia excommunicated um, the Molling Maguires. Uh, it, in effect, I mean, that's a theological concept too, but um, disowned uh, them and condemned them. And so um, the Molly Maguires were outliers. They were outsiders. They were very, they were the most marginalized of the Irish. They were often Irish speakers. They were often from Donegal. They were disowned by the twin pillars of their own uh, community, uh, the two most important institutions in the community, the Catholic Church and the labor movement. At the same time, they faced violence from others. Uh -huh. uh, the Pinkertons used vigilante attacks. Uh, against Molly Maguire's. They killed that Molly, uh, pregnant Molly Maguire woman and her husband in one of those attacks. The Reading Railroad had its own private police force, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, terrorized labor. And the state of Pennsylvania, using its monopoly over legitimate violence, uh, hanged 20 men. So it's a very violent story. Mm -hmm. uh, the in my, in my conviction after all this time, and I still... Uh, I believe 25 years ago, and I believe it now, is, is that whoever they were and whatever they called themselves, we don't even know if they called themselves Molly Maguires, they were called that from the outside, but whoever they were, that under certain um, very difficult and challenging conditions, um, certain Irish immigrants fought back against their exploitation with violence. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and while I wait, just I'll remind people if yeah. you want to ask a question, you know, you have to use this Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So just make your screen come awake. Um, how how um, significant, you know, you mentioned nativism and, and uh, that, and you know, you think by 1875, we were over a lot of that from the 1845s, you yeah. know, and, yeah. but how significant was the, the anti-Catholic? I know Gilded Age, it's more labor versus, you know, corporate yeah. kind of but was uh, the Catholicism a, a feature, do you think? Yes, very much. And mm. uh, certainly wasn't over by the 1870s. And mm. uh, it may have been over by 1960. John F. Kennedy did have to say, I, I am mm. not the Catholic candidate for, for president of the United States. I am the Democratic candidate who happens to be a Catholic. Uh, Joe Biden uh 50 years later, uh, did not have to confront that question. So so that that tradition did end. Um, I was just teaching this today and uh, uh, reminded my students, I've come across a quote that anti-Catholicism was the one intellectually respectable form of bigotry uh, yeah. uh, as late as 1960. So um, anti-Catholic anti nativism is uh, hugely important here. There's a very strong class dimension that I've brought out um, but the Irish as Catholics uh, were suspect. Um, Irish uh, American, on which side of the hyphen did the loyalty lie? Uh, there was a very sustained um, uh, anti-Catholic dimension to hostility to Irish immigrants. So yeah, that plays into it uh, in the perception of the Irish as somehow um, not suitable uh, uh, candidates for um citizenship in the United States for belonging in the United States. Um, Anti-Catholic and anti-labor um, nativism really, really go hand in hand. There were no Catholics, um, no Catholics served on the juries, no Irish served on the juries. Um, we have to judge what was a travesty of justice not by our own standards, but by the standards of the day. Uh, but even even by the standards of the day, what happened in the courtroom was was pretty appalling. Yeah, you're right. And so, you know, to be tried in groups is it yeah. seems to be crazy. And and surely four or five of the men might have had nothing at all to do with you know what was going on. Yeah, yeah. it's it's so hard. To, we can, we'll never know for certain. So twenty of them were hanged. Mm -hmm. uh, some uh, what we see. Um, and getting back to your first question is. Uh, the pattern whereby mm -hmm. the men uh, accused of planning the conspiracies uh, were the leaders of local AOH lodges, and they were also tavern keepers. Mm -hmm. uh, they were um, often former mine workers. And being a tavern keeper was extremely uh, important, um, potentially powerful. Some, some of them were, were getting involved in local politics as well. As a tavern keeper, you had your finger on the pulse of the entire community and wages were paid and spent in the taverns. Uh, all of the reports, and we can't take them at face value, but um, we have to read them. All of the reports from the Pinkertons indicate that in certain taverns, the tavern keepers who were also uh, what were called body masters, um, heads of AOH lodges, um, uh, would... Uh, were at the heart of some kind of conspiracy. And what they did was they called in um, young men from neighboring towns who belonged to other lodges to actually perform the deeds. Now, you have to disentangle you know, the nativist con uh, conspiracy thinking from the reality of what was going on. But that that's a very familiar pattern from Irish history as well, mm -hmm. right? Uh, calling in the stranger uh, to return a favor and that that favor is la is later returned so something was going on there uh, but it's 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 born of desperation uh it's a situation that arises when large numbers of um impoverished marginalized unskilled men are uh, thrown together it's a heavily male community it's what we might see as a wild west frontier community mm -hmm. later in uh in American history, but it's you know a semi-rural area with lots and lots of uh, immigrants, lots and lots of young men. Ethnic conflict between the Irish and the Welsh. The Welsh had their own gangs. Uh, fire companies, volunteer fire companies in the nineteenth century were um, led by ethnic groups. And you know if you look at the sources, you'll see that there were often fires on a Saturday night. Mm 
Oh. And, uh, <laughs> both uh, both fire companies, Welsh and Irish, would come in from either side of the town, ignore the fire and start fighting. And I, I even found evidence of fires being started deliberately to, to attract them in. So you have to put it in that context. You have to add alcohol to the mix. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you one story that sticks in my mind of um, a very detailed account um, of the murder of one um, Welshman who was a, uh, it was a payroll robbery. Uh, so so, so uh, the way it worked was that the, the man stayed up. Uh, so the story goes, right? And how much veracity is in the story? There's some. Uh, mm -hmm. They stayed up all night in the tavern um, drinking, and then they hid behind the bushes until the, the victim came along, and they jumped out and they shot him. Uh, he wasn't carrying the money. And the last line in the, in the sources, and I reproduce it in the book, is that uh, the pity of it was uh, that we killed the wrong man. Yeah. So you have to you have to put it in that context as well. Yeah. Yeah. I see a question there. We yeah. did. So yeah. Regina wants to know: Were any of the Pinkertons or the other coal operators' forces of violence ever prosecuted? No, uh, they they were not. And you know, the, there's very clear evidence in the sources that the Pinkertons um, uh, launched a vigilante attack. Uh, we know that they did. And it, 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 uh, just an interesting sidelight, when I was doing the research, um, I was living in New York City, and my strategy was to um, save the local research for last and do the research out in the Pennsylvania mining region and in Ireland. And then I got to one of the, the um, source important uh, source bases on my um, list with a 212 phone number. And I called them and I said, I need to look at some of your documents. It was the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. Uh, the number had been changed. And so I called the new number and I said, oh, by the way, where are you? And they said, we're in Van Nuys, uh, California, in L.A. <laughs> so I, had to, I flew out to L.A. just to see uh, documents that clearly um, demonstrated the involvement of the Pinkertons in yeah. killing Molly Maguire's. Were they ever prosecuted? No. Uh, in, in no way. Uh, James McParlin uh, went on to a successful career in the um, Pinkerton Detective Agency, he moved out west, and he became involved in a case um, where the governor of uh, Idaho uh, was uh, killed uh, uh, in a labor struggle, and he tried the old Molly Maguire tactics, which is, you know, drumming up evidence. Um, he came up against Clarence Darrow, mm. famous American lawyer, and Dar Darrow uh, exposed his tactics and the men were exonerated. So, um, but no, no, no Pinkertons were ever um, held culpable. Franklin Benjamin Gowan um, won his, his short-term battle. Uh, he, he secured uh, monopoly control over the uh, coal industry in the lower region, he never made money out of it. It was too difficult uh, because you needed the technology for deep shaft mining there. And uh, his company went into receivership and uh, was bought out by JP Morgan. And on 1889, I think it is December 13th, of course, um, Franklin Gowan uh, in his hotel room in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, he had gone out to buy a pistol and he shot himself in the head. Wow. Uh, the rumors in the national press, of course, were that the Molly Maguires <laughs> have back. finally taken their revenge. This is the type of thing that Arthur yeah. Conan Doyle would have liked. Uh, yeah. But no, he, 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 in the end, he killed himself. Wow. Yeah. And, um, you know, here you talk about the masculinity and stuff. And of course, up here in Albany, you know, we yeah. have the Erie Canal. Yeah. It was amazing, or is it amazing, how little, you know, the, the labor conditions and, and, grog and all of these things you know feed into keeping that that kind of working yeah oh, i suppose it's physically dangerous maybe and so there is an element of you just have to numb yourself you know to it this is the yeah this is the rough culture of yeah. irish canal labor and public works and then on into into the right roads and ap thompson who i mentioned earlier in my talk you know described the the Irish as a kind of a mobile proletariat for the yeah. building of the infrastructure of the Industrial Revolution on both sides of the Atlantic. In um, industrial England, as well as in America, um, alcohol consumption was built into the daily work life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, part of the wages, if you like, uh, involved yeah. um, a steady supply of alcohol. So it's a, it's a, 
recipe for it's disaster. a rough uh very masculine culture and mining community communities worldwide often involve violence this is a particular expression of it yeah and just while we're on that topic and maybe it's a small bit off topic it, it, do you think i always am struck that there's kind of this opportunity lost with the working men's benevolent association yeah Sorry. yeah i think they were so fantastic and i know we go on to have you know terence powderly in the night yeah 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 um what's her name mother jones but that really seems to have been progressive in the true sense in that you know it didn't matter your level or you kind of yeah. your nationality that seems to have been a massive opportunity lost there after avondale and those disasters in, in in that region so yeah. so re really it's the an expression of one of two traditions in mm -hmm. american trade unionism it's the tradition of the one big union mm -hmm. uh, which which is open to everyone um uh, and that model you know moving beyond the wba um that's a model the one big union is open to all workers uh um black white or other protestant or catholic skilled or unskilled male male or female um it's not a tradition that's entirely lost uh, because it, you see it with the industrial workers of the world, the Wobblies in the early 20th century. And of course, you see it in the, Cong the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, mm -hmm. half of AFL-CIO uh, emerged from that tradition. The AFL, on the other hand, the American Federation of Labor was a federation of skilled workers. Uh -huh. So it was uh, it, 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 an alternative strategy was just to mobilize the skilled. Uh -huh. now, the skilled are going to be much more often native born and uh -huh. male. Uh -huh. uh, the idea, nonetheless, is is that by representing fewer workers uh, of a more powerful uh, background, you'll exact more political leverage. And uh, 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 eventually, AFL and CIO come together, of course, uh -huh. in the country. But there, there's two traditions there, and the Working Men's Benevolent Association, like the Knights of Labour, and like the, um, in a way, like the Industrial Workers of the World, of course, were involved in what's called an anarcho syndicalism, bringing trade unionism and elements of anarchism together. Yeah. And, and were associated with violence in a way that the, too, exactly. the WBA was not. Not, yeah. yeah. And so, like, it obviously didn't suit going for them. You know, you have to wonder, Um, yeah, so Regina just asked, was the Benevolent Association from a socialist tradition? Uh, it not... Not really, really socialist, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah, not quite socialist, but coming out of uh, a movement, uh, they're very influenced actually by English trade unionism and something called the Chartist movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they're coming out of, a, you know, an inclusive and politically democratic uh, movement. Uh, they believed in workers' political rights as well as economic rights. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably wouldn't characterize it as quite socialist. Uh, yeah. And if uh, with the kinds of socialism that were emerging at the time, uh, but democratic, egalitarian, uh, open to all workers, power in numbers, and then using uh, the weapon of the strike uh, to curtail production of coal, drive the price of coal up and try and tag that to wages. Yeah, yeah. And again, it kind of suited going for that to fail, but maybe he fanned the flames of the violence too much, on the, you know, if, if he was involved there or, or the fact that there was a vacuum left, you know. Yeah, um, he, he saw the WBA as his, the chief... Uh, labor yeah. obstacle in his path yeah. that set out to destroy it and yeah. his tactic was to argue again and again and again that the molly Maguires were just the terrorist wing of of the labor of movement the labor there was some movement. overlap uh, some molly Maguires probably mm -hmm. belonged to the labor move the trade union itself who was open mm -hmm. to them mm -hmm. but some also um favored tactics that the union itself uh condemned as morally wrong and mm -hmm. uh, and counterproductive Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, given the fact that yesterday was Halloween, will you comment a little bit on the supernatural element, or do you care about that? You know, the the fact that there's supposed to be a handprint on the jail still, and when one of the men were killed, the lights went out in Sligo or whoever it was. Well, it's, it's very it's, part of the myth, you know. It is. It's very powerful. It is. Um, or yeah. does somebody paint on the handprint? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are parts of the the positive myth. I mean, there uh, the 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 negative myth was the Irish as savages. Yeah. Uh, the counter myth to that is the Irish as 
innocent all Irish as by definition innocent victims of of and the Molly Maguires were just framed and I'm trying to break away from both of those the the handprint um on the on the wall uh, that's um Alexander Campbell was one of the tavern keepers in um that's in Jim Thorpe uh, Mortchuk okay. in Carbon County and I, I I knew some of his descendants uh, among the descendants I met of the Molly Maguires um and that's where I gave that lecture I mentioned yeah. uh, in the prison outside the cell. Uh, he was kept in the night before he was hanged. And of course, the the, the, um, the handprint on the wall it won't go away until he is uh, exonerated. Um, there's another thing about Halloween too, though. I'm glad you mentioned it because the, <laughs> if, if you're looking at the... Um, who, what the Molly Maguires were like in in Ireland, the ones I described that were um, avenging themselves against what they saw as transgressions and a moral code to do with land, uh, not land ownership, but access to land mm -hmm. and how, how, how land could be used and issues of that kind. Uh, I often try and explain it this way. Uh, the Think of Halloween, um, but think of it uh, as one where the children are um, uh, safely at home <laughs> and it's the adults that are out yeah. and the adults are dressed oh, uh, in, in, in disguise and with burned cork or white powder and the trick or treat element is uh, give us what we want or we'll come back and burn your house down. Yeah. So it's out of, you know, Halloween is an Irish festival as we know yeah. um, but it's out of this um, these old traditions of um protest and violence involving disguise and cross cross dressing where festivity mm -hmm. can translate into something much more ominous mm -hmm. uh, that's what molly mcguireism and white boyism uh in ireland was yeah. and so there is a connection there with halloween and, yeah. and those notes you know with the skulls and cops, yeah 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 intimidating. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it wasn't all invented, right? There was mm -hmm. something there. And what I'm trying to do in the book is is mediate between extreme positions. Yeah, on both sides. Make some attempt. The historian's job really is to um, recognize the violence that did take place on multiple sides and to try to understand and explain it. Not to condemn it, not to justify it, but just to try and come to terms uh, on the basis of evidence and inference um, uh, uh, with what happened there. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I think the fact that you grounded it, you know, as you said, these men, a lot of them were rural. They would have absolutely seen that at home in Ireland, you know, not yeah. just yeah. when hunger, but after. Yeah. It's a massive tradition of white boys and crappy. Yeah, all yeah, yeah. Them, you know? yeah. And, so, and a, a, you know, a massive distrust of the yeah, state, of the authorities. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah a massive alienation from... from uh, civic society and and for this reason um you know that there was an aspiring um irish middle class that mm -hmm. wanted to speak for the community and that and it's for that reason that they distanced themselves from the, mm -hmm. the older tradition like sevna's book the end of outrage mm -hmm. um to, the end in the sense of the goal of these insurgents yeah. the end of the sense of, of it's the termination of a tradition by the famine mm -hmm. uh, Thirdly, the end in the sense of we don't we don't remember it. We don't we don't we don't want to come to terms with it. Uh, yeah. But these things did happen. Did happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, look, thank you very much. I think there weren't any questions um, on our YouTube channel either. And we had a good few in there. So um, you did a great job, of course, of explaining it all. We will have copies of the book in stock. And in the meantime, you can check your local listings. We won't say the name of the online store, but I'm sure it's available there, too. Um, <laughs> We are back tomorrow at 5.30 um, New York time with Dr. Chloe the Tate from Ireland who's going to talk to us about crisis apparitions, which were um, an example of people, you know, immigrants. Regina says great presentation. Thank you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> where examples of, you know, immigrants see somebody that has mm -hmm. died right before they get news or before yeah, the news yeah. it's time to travel. So that'll be on tomorrow. Oh, my goodness. In keeping yeah. with, yeah, yeah the, the yeah, Halloween yeah. tradition yeah. of the All Saints yeah. also. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, Dr. Henny, thank you. And congratulations. We might have you back at some point to talk about your um, the book about policing and immigrants. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, Anytime. <laughs> thank you. Ireland might okay. have had a, 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 you know, a little element in that and, and mm -hmm. how police mm -hmm. can lead to entrapment and all that, too. But that's yeah, yeah. discussion yeah. for another night.
So thank you very much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.